Welcome everybody in the uh, first in net quantum colloquium meeting. Uh, yes, we started with a bit of delay, but I guess it's not a problem. Uh, right, we, we have a pleasure to, to host uh, Will Garcia Patron Sanchez today with us, uh, who will be talking about uh, uh, well, limitations of near term algorithms and noise devices. But before I formally introduce the, the speaker, uh, let's say I, I wanted, okay, I haven't introduced myself. <laughs> yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, okay, you see my name, like I'm Michael Schmeitz. I work in Center for Theoretical Physics. And uh, uh, right, I'll be the, the let's say the, the chair of the meeting today. And I wanted to take some liberty first to uh, just acknowledge, uh, um, yeah, the like terrible situation uh, we kind of experiencing nowadays, uh, like with regards to Ukraine and the war that happened there after Russia invaded this country. Yeah, I don't have much to say about this except for maybe just statement of support and solidarity from like our side. Uh, just wanted to mention that. Uh, Polish Academ Academy of Sciences, as well as other in academic institutions in Poland, they currently offer support to science, uh, quite concrete support to scientists that are coming, uh, that let's say are willing to leave uh, Ukraine and they can basically work in Poland for a couple of months at least now. So I put just logo of Polish Academy of Sciences, but I know for a fact that, for instance, in the Faculty of Physics of your Warsaw University, there are some initiatives uh, along similar lines. So, just uh, you know, uh, I imagine that, like, yeah, it will be possible to get this kind of support from many places in Poland in the near future. Right. So, with with this uh, like unfortunate kind of topic out of the way. Like, okay, let's move to science that can be stressful, but maybe not as stressful as, as war. <laughs> right, so just a bit of context about like this, uh, this meeting. So, and our like team net project. Uh, right, so, uh, okay, let me switch gears because it's a really different topic. Right, so, you know, we, we, uh, we, we live in times when uh, there are like great pro uh, promises and hopes that, that people attribute to quantum compu computers. So uh, with the involvement of uh, industry, the uh, chips devices currently available, they are becoming much more, uh, more and more complex. They have more and more qubits. Uh, coherence times are better. Okay, so there is uh, definitely some progress there. Still, uh, it's important to acknowledge that uh, those near-term devices, they are not uh, omnipotent, like they, they, they are limited in what they can do, especially in the near future. And, you know, we should be very kind of skeptical, I mean, as scientists, uh, or maybe more generally as physicists, yeah, physicists, as, science, as physicists, as scientists, maybe, but as society as a whole, towards some um, you know, bombastic claims that, that get mixed with politics as well. Uh, you know, uh, like for example, okay, like uh, remember a couple of years ago when Google announced that it attained this quantum computational advantage, uh, uh, that, okay, what, that, what they uh, could do on quantum computer is, was supposed to take 10,000 years on some greatest supercomputer, but uh, it was a bit of exaggeration actually or already at that point. Uh, and nowadays people are much more, let's say, realistic about it. And I think you can simulate uh, basically performance of that chip much like within a few hours or on the moderate uh, size uh, GPU class, uh, ideally. Or like you, you, we cannot expect to break RSA 
crypto uh, encryption uh, in few hours in the near term there is no uh, way right we are mile, miles away from from this neither we can perform time travel with the use uh, with the help of quantum computers or like present day quantum compu uh, computers they won't help us with uh, covid diagnostics uh, right Actually, I saw this news when I was, uh, I mean, more or less like I had COVID myself, mild, luckily, <laughs> it was hilarious. <laughs> anyway, okay, so uh, basically the purpose of this colloquium series is to, is to provide, uh, like to, uh, yeah, uh, is to give you, let's say, high quality content and some updates on recent developments in the field of quantum computing but I'll detach from the high from the height okay fo fo focusing on scientific excellence okay okay so and this colloquium series is organized uh, within our like team net project that is a consortium of uh, four uh, of three uh, research uh, institutes uh, center for theoretical physics in Warsaw Institute for uh, Applied and Theoretical uh, Computer Science in Gliwice and Jagiellonian University in uh, Krakow. Uh, right, so basically we try to do uh, theoretical research that addresses those kind of questions that come into play when, when uh, quantum computers uh, scale up and they have uh, like uh, yeah, the, they're in this intermediate scale, scale regime. So specifically, we work in areas like mitiga mitiga uh, error mitigation, characterization, and benchmarking, uh, quantum resource, uh, resources, near-term algorithms, quantum machine learning, or quantum error correction. I don't want to take it, mostly it should be Raoul's talk, and it will be, don't worry. Just wanted to mention people, uh, most important people involved in the project. So. Professor Mike Push, I'm not sure if he's in the audience, is a project leader and coordinates it from Center for Theoretical Physics in Warsaw. There is Karol Zyszkowski, who uh, kind of uh, is important on the side of Jagiellonia University. And there, there is Felix Huber, who, who was a leader working on uh, quantum error correction myself in Warsaw. Kami Kozwekfa working on quantum resources, and finally is Bushek Puchawa from Gliwice working on quantum machine learning. Okay, that's that's it I wanted to say about us uh, now just moving to uh, sub actual subject of the uh, matter. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Raul Garcia Patron from University of Edinburgh. So Raul is a well-known sp specialist in like various areas of quantum information, like quantum uh, cryptography, uh, quantum communication. Uh, in the past, uh, Raul worked a lot with uh, uh, optical systems uh, in like with continuous variables. Like for example, his co-author of uh, important review of uh, on the subject. Uh, yeah, so uh, in his career, like he touched like a plethora of uh, great institutions, uh, like uh, he did PhD in University of Brussels, then he spent some time as a postdoc in MIT, I guess among others, worked with Seth Lloyd, for example, then uh, another great place, NPQ in, uh, in Munich, uh, uh, right. That, then he, he, he had a tenured position in the University of Brussels, but finally he, he moved to the University of uh, Edinburgh as a senior lecturer. I think it was in 2019, if I remember well. Right. It, right, right before the pandemic. Just before the pandemic. One month before being locked down, yes. <laughs> okay, so, but okay, in recent years, scientific interest, at least from my perspective of Raoul, shifted a bit from communication and, uh, I mean, probably we still work on this, and uh, like the standard traditional quantum information towards quantum computing, especially 
uh, like uh, I've worked on limitate uh, on questions regarding limitations on near term devices, classical simulability, quantum supremacy. I mean, mostly in the optical context. So that concerned boson. Um, okay, boson something largely. Yes, but today uh, he will be talking a very exciting topic, namely like what what can we do with those variational algorithms uh, on noisy devices. So sorry for this like a bit lengthy introduction. The the, the screen and the rest of the time uh, is yours. Uh, just one more thing. Sorry, I, I had too many things to say for the beginning. The format is like the following. So we have uh, uh, roughly 50 minutes for, for the talk itself. Maybe uh, less then we have a we'll have a session of questions to Raul. But if you really want to ask questions, like in the middle of the talk, please raise your hand virtually. Uh, and then, like, uh, like uh, yeah, uh, we uh, like Raul will answer the question. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, thanks again. And uh, now, Raul, you can, uh, yeah, turn on your screen. Uh, I think you. Uh, ah, no, no, I can't say. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much for the introduction while I'm sharing my screen. So maybe uh, if there's any question, I, I can try to answer, but it may happen that I don't notice there is a question. So if you, Susan, just can keep an eye whether there is any question, it will be great. Um, let me. Now, uh, share my screen. Oh, sorry, I shared the screen. Let me uh, do the full screen. Okay, so now you should be seeing my slides, uh, and I hope you are hearing me. No? Yes, uh, so can yes, perfect. yes. <laughs> perfect. So, uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to, to be here for the especially starting this colloquium. So, it's nice. Uh, it's very convenient to do it from home. <laughs> in previous times, I would have had to fly to, to Barcelona, which indeed I, I have a few times and I like it very much. Um, so unfortunately, also I have a few things before, <laughs> before we really start. Uh, also, Michelle, you had a bit of few words, so I wanted to say also a couple of things. Uh, you all pros probably recognize this uh, painting. Uh, it's called Guernica. Uh, it was painted by Picasso during the Civil War in Spain, uh, commissioned for the exposition in Paris, uh, war exposition. And probably it's, it represents basically the uh, bombing of the Nazis of a town in Spain. And it's the, civil, the Spanish Civil War is probably the first time where a massive uh, bombing of civilians was used as a military strategy. Unfortunately, we are seeing that again in Europe in the next in the last days and in the following days will continue that's very bad uh it's really shocking uh and it's especially frustrating we there is very little we can do about it uh i mean there's things that can be done but uh the situation is very bad uh i hope I hope that in the future we will see a better world for all of us, especially Ukrainians and also Russians. I hope they get a better uh, leadership in the next years because what they have now is really horrible. Um, so that was what I wanted to say. Um, and after this, uh, let's start to our business, <laughs> as Michelle said. So let's start to let's return to quantum computation. Okay, so. As Michelle said, there is a lot of hype uh, and there's a lot of progress too. So that's also true, okay? There's a lot of progress in the hardware. There's a lot of interest. There's a lot of progress on the algorithms. Uh, but I have to say that, well, it will next year will be 20 years I started my PhD. <laughs> Time goes fast. Uh, when I was a PhD student by then, uh, uh, I thought that I will never see a quantum computer uh, in my life uh, working, I mean, by a quantum computer that solves a problem that is relevant. I knew there will be some progress, but I was not hoping to see it. Uh, now I have hope I will see one quantum computer something, solving something useful. Uh, what we are seeing now is a 
progress on that direction. And here you can see the roadmap of IBM that was published maybe last year or two years ago. Um, and, and how they were planning to scale their system. And you have all this nice uh, explanation of how they are going to increase the size and how are they going to add few things to their hardware and software and new tools. And, but something is never really mentioned in the roadmap to the public is what is going to be the priority of error of the gates. I mean, they publish that on papers, they, but it's very hard to get an information on that. And it's very, and this is probably the more relevant information you want to know when you want to assess uh, what a quantum computer can do today, especially before reaching uh, a fault tolerance quantum computation. But even then, that information is crucial. So it's very good to have an idea of how it's going to be growing, but what the information, the key information here missing is what is this variety of error of the gates. And so this error of the gate is kind of the elephant in the room. <laughs> so as Michel was saying, there is all this hype, uh, but uh, I, we are all talking about how, how great things we can do with quantum computer, but there is this big elephant in the room uh, that we don't see, <laughs> it's just in the corner, it's very big, but, uh, and it's the imperfections of the quantum computers, right? So, so this is something we need to tackle uh, and it's there. We cannot avoid it. Okay, so my work, uh, this talk, uh, is not only about fighting this uh, nonsense hype. Okay, I have to confess that it's part of my motivation. Uh, it was a bit uh, frustrating to see all these advertise, all these ads, and all this discussion that is very high. But I also think it's not just. It's not just fighting the hype, but it's just, I think that if you understand better how and when quantum computers fail, it will help us to build maybe better quantum computers and also discover at which task quantum computers are better no? by understanding how, when they don't work that well, or what we can understand which kind of problems are more, um, uh, more better suited for a quantum computer. Okay? So these quantum supremacy experiments that uh, were mentioned uh, very briefly by Michelle at the beginning, uh, like this quantum supremacy experiment that Google did that was published in Nature. Here I'm giving you the, the screenshot of the Nature uh, paper. Uh, basically, all these statements were almost, uh, I mean, the discussion at the time was, oh, if you pass some threshold of size of the system, then you are almost there. You have rich supremacy. If you reach 56 qubits beyond that, you are, you are happy. In some sense, this, there was some boundary here in red. You can see um, if you were in, in, in green here, you have some area where if you are below that size of the system, you can classically simulate it with some kind of brute force matrix multiplication or maybe some clever tensor network techniques, uh, but beyond some threshold, then nothing can be done. And then you have reached supremacy. That we know most of the people, I mean, most of the people knew it was not very much uh, discussed or, or resonated much on, 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 the, on, on the media, but that situation was not exactly that, okay? So we, we, you probably have seen this picture where you can see the, the decrease of the fidelity uh, of, the, of a random quantum circuit as you increase the number of qubits, for example. No? Here you have the fidelity. Indeed, I, I remember giving a talk uh, in Barso a few years ago where I was showing these figures. Maybe some of you remember. Uh, I, I now remember giving the, that talk three, probably three years ago. Um, Okay, so the fidelity decreases with, with, with the, as the size of the system increases. So intuitively, there will be at some point where this breaks down and, and it's, it's very close to just max, uh, uh, maximally, mix, uh, maximally mixed state or just completely random coin. And that can be classically simulated. So where this transition from something that is hard to simulate to something that easy to simulate is an interesting question. Uh, and uh, what is the whole noise affect the system and at which point it breaks down. 
So somehow the picture is more like this, okay? So what is interesting is that if you have here on the Y axis, what is the error priority per gate, okay? So it's not the total error of the system, but really here I'm trying to picture the error priority per gate. Uh, so the, the higher it is, the more errors you have. And here is the, problem, the kind of the size of your quantum circuit on the, on the X axis. So somehow for the intuition is for a given priority of error, uh, you will find some classical arguments that are, can cleverly use the fact that you know there is errors uh, in order to do a classical simulation more efficiently, okay? So beyond some threshold, the idea is that beyond some threshold, there will be a regime where is, the system becomes classically simulable again. And this is what I'm picturing here with this gray area, okay? And somehow this gray area also limits the quantum advantage, potential quantum advantage regime uh, area, uh, and this reduces it to uh, this corner that is inside the red uh, boundary. So whether your quantum Google or whatever Chinese experiment uh, lies is maybe probably in this very little corner here where we can have some hope of, of um, claim of quantum supremacy, but maybe later someone, uh, someone else comes with a better classical algorithm and lowers this boundary. And then what was before a claim of quantum supremacy is no longer a claim, it's, it's no longer a quantum supremacy. No? And in this, this is what is happening. It's a back and forth between the people doing the experiments and the people doing classical algorithms. Uh, indeed, probably you remember uh, last few months, there has been, a, oh, you remember, or, well, or I'm telling you for those who don't know, uh, there was a paper um, indeed in November, November of 2021, so uh, last November, uh, from three Chinese uh, researchers showing a tensor network technique uh, that is able, uh, in principle, to simulate the Sycamore device, okay? Of course, their model of the noise is a bit uh, a toy model. Uh, I mean, it's a bit constructed to make it work, but it's not even the polarizing noise. So, so you could think about improving this for, further, but uh, so it looks like uh, even now we have classical algorithms that potentially can simulate the, those potential quantum supremacy claims in the past, okay? And there has been other works in related to Gaussian boson sampling, for example, more recently, indeed in, in the past, as, as uh, mentioned, I had been working uh, some of my research, the way in, in I started working on quantum computation topics or publishing on those topics was through boson sampling. And basically we did a quite a bit of work on Explo exploiting the fact that we know that the system has uh, imperfections, basically losses and in, uh, distinguishability of photons to make the classical simulation faster. Okay? Um, but there is a lot of work to do still on Gaussian boson sampling in that direction, for example. Um, okay, but this, this kind of work that I have been discussing until now, they are uh, kind of, what I call benchmarking quantum advantage, okay? Like using classical algorithms to limit what is the area where you can hope to have quantum advantage. But this is a, what we, I consider a problem agnostic benchmarking in the sense that, sorry? Okay, I, I continue. So this is what I consider a problem agnostic benchmark, benchmarking in the sense that your target is to simulate the actual quantum device. Okay, but another approach will be, okay, this is maybe too much, or maybe I don't need to do that. Uh, maybe what I just need to do is to mimic what the computer is trying, the quantum computer is trying to do. So the quantum computer is gonna be used to solve a problem. Now what I want is, can I find a clever classical algorithm that is trying to solve the same problem uh, uh, or, or better than the quantum computer or simulate the quantum computer solving that problem uh, so simulating a noisy quantum computer solving that problem, for example, circumventing basically the 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 brute for the simulation of the circuit itself, because somehow simulating a quantum circuit is, is looks like a bit of a bottleneck. So can you think circumvent the simulation of the quantum circuit and just address directly the the problem the quantum computer is trying to solve? And this is what this work uh, is about. Okay. 
this is a work I did with Daniel Steele Franza. We did most of the work indeed. Um, he's a very bright scientist. Uh, he is now moving to Lyon with a permanent position. He was in Copenhagen at the time. I was visiting for a month. And we did a series of, of papers together uh, that were kind of released um, last, well, last year. And this was one of them. Uh, so this is what I'm going to talk uh, next. But first, maybe let let give you an intuition. Okay, Our work is kind of formalizing the following intuition. So let's do an intuition from a back of the envelope calculation. So let's assume that we have a two qubit system, and we are doing two qubit gates one after the other. Okay, and we don't have any quantum error correction. So every gate has a priority of failure. So somehow the intuition is that the depth of the circuit you can build out of that is basically one divide the number of layers you can do of gates is one divided by the priority of failure of every gate. Okay, um, that's kind of an easy estimate. Uh, so if you do the assumption that once one gate fails, your quantum computation is completely lost or useless, which is another assumption, okay, then you can very quickly uh, arrive to the conclusion that the maximum debt will be really proportional to one divided by the priority of error. Of course, here there's a lot of assumption. It's all back of the envelope. There is no proof or not anything. <clears throat> and if the system is larger than two, two qubits, well, it can only be worse. No, that's also the intuition. So, so let's do some analysis with this. Okay. So now we have n qubit system, and then the priority of error of single qubit gates. Let's be nice. Uh, just consider one qubit gate error priorities is uh, is of the order of ten to the minus three. Okay. So this will mean that your depth of the circuit can be at most 1,000, which of course I'm being extremely generous uh, because this is not what is done now. Now we may have like 100 or something like that, no, not thousands, okay? Then uh, you want to use that for something. And for example, you may have, to, may want to implement some quantum algorithm uh, like QAIA. And every layer of QA has a number of, lay of layers of gates, no? like for example, eight in this, in this example, I were of an experiment by Google, it was like eight set set gates per layer of QA or something like that. Um, so I will, can you just briefly uh, just comment what is QA away? Ah, uh, yes. Well, uh, I don't want to go into the detail, but just take, just take an algorithm. And this is a variational algorithm that I will explain what is a variational algorithm later. And this is composed of different layers, no? That's, and the more layers you have, maybe the better is the solution. So every layer is a constant number of, of, of gates, okay? This is kind of my, 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 what I just need now, okay? And, and then this means that uh, maybe you can do a uh, hundred layers of QA, just, I'm being extremely generous. <laughs> but then, then uh, somehow the number of layers of QA so the, the number of, 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 of layers you can do will be also connected to the size of the problem you can solve, okay? Somehow, even if or the problem we initial, with the statement we initially started was some limitation on the depth of the circuit, you can easily find some kind of limitation on the size of instances of graphs you can solve, okay? You want to solve, for example, a given problem on a graph, a problem about a graph, um, and you will use QA for that, then very quickly uh, having a bound on the depth is going to tell you a bound on the size of the system. Okay. And so very, with very sim simple back of the envelope calculations, you can very quickly get orders of magnitude of size of problems you can hope to solve with current devices. Okay. So what what we did is somehow to, for, to make this uh, rigorous with a proof in some sense, okay? Because the, that, that back of the envelope uh, estimation is, is, has no rigorous proof at all, okay? So I'm, I'm gonna give you an, so we build a recipe, a technique, but it can be applied to many different problems, uh, even potentially to quantum problems, but I'm gonna just give you the example of a specific, a specific optimization problem more concretely to mass cut, no? and how you can map mass cut to a sync model. So basically mass cut, you are giving a graph, okay? I, here I'm giving you a graph with vertices and edges. Uh, and the problem of mass cut is you have to color somehow the vertices 
in two colors. You have to make two different sets of vertices in a way that you want to maximize the number of edges that are uh, crossing the two sets. Okay, so for example, here I choose to color them in green or orange. Okay, and then every edge that has edges of different color uh, is a plus one. Uh, it contributes to the cut, okay, because it's separating two sets. Where, for example, here the red, uh, sorry, the blue edge between two greens, it doesn't contribute to the cut because it's, it's an edge that is in between two uh, elements of the same group. Where the black here is uh, also connecting two vertices of the same color, so it doesn't contribute to the cut. Somehow the idea is you want to distribute your vertices into two groups in the way that you optimize the edges that are uh, cro uh, crossing between the two sets. Okay. And this can be uh, made into an icing, into an icing mo uh, problem. Okay, so you can think about your vertices as pins plus minus one, uh, and then you will have a con energy configuration, a classical spins. Okay, plus minus one, and then you can define the total energy of a given configuration by just the sum of the product of uh, of the spins here. Okay, so so basically this this problem here, what happens is if you have two spins of different color, it will be that they are different spin. And this is a plus one, uh, sorry, a, a minus one, okay? Because the problem we want, the equivalent uh, Hamiltonian problem will be minimize the energy, okay? Sorry, that's, that's important. So what was before maximizing the cut, now is we are gonna transform it into a minim minimization of an energy, okay? So basically before we wanted to have the maximum number of links of different colors, here we want, it means that when you have two spins of different orientation, you will have a minus contribution to your energy. So basically by minimizing the energy, you are uh, maximizing the number of cuts, okay? So you can find a connection between um, what is the minimization of the energy, uh, you, this a connection between the energy of the configuration and what is a cut of that configuration of spins, uh, what will be the minimization of the energy will be the maximization of the cut, okay? So solving one, you solve the other. So in full generality, you can think about problems like this, optimization problems I, I have in this lower box here where you have a given row. Uh, it could be a dis priority distribution row, just the diagonal uh, of, of the density matrix, if it's a classical spin, but you could think about a quantum problem too. You will have an Hamiltonian. In our case, this Hamiltonian is basically uh, also a diagonal and it represents some kind of classical spin system. But you can generalize this to other Hamiltonians, and you want to minimize this uh, this uh, fun cost function, okay? Uh, this Hamiltonian, uh, and as I said before, you can encode optimis classical optimization problems, but you can have some quantum problems, uh, as people in many body physics have been solved for many years, right? Okay, so so computer scientists have designed different strategies to solve these problems. Um, it's a minimization problem. And the way I like to explain this to, this, to my students uh, when I was explaining BQE is you can think of being on a skiing, res a skiing resort and you are at the top of the mountain and you want to reach the minimal point. So a valid strategy to reach in the minimal point will see, oh, you, you are just there with your skis and you just look around yourself and you just go into the direction that looks with the highest slope can be quite dangerous <laughs> if you are not a skilled skier, but that's a reasonable strategy. And this is what uh, computer scientists call uh, a greedy algorithm or using gradient descent, for example. Uh, but you can add other techniques to your tools, okay? And you could think, oh, why, I'm not, uh, why not allowing myself sometimes to go up? No? And you, there are people that practice cross country skiing, uh, and indeed, people that know me know that I have a very funny story about cross-country skiing in the Czech Republic that I can explain one day <laughs> after the talk. But uh, anyway, um, that was during a research uh, visit to Olomouc, uh, by the way, during my PhD time. Anyway, so basically, uh, you can allow yourself sometimes, randomly, you allow yourself to go up. That's going worse somehow. Uh, you, you are not going down for a time, but this may allow you to reach another valley of the, of the area. And then after that, you can go even deeper than before, for example, okay? So that's another tool. And this is what 
people using simulated annealing. Okay? With some probability, you allow yourself to go up. And why not do something else than this, uh, do variational quantum algorithms? So introduce quantumness into this. And I like this, this picture I found uh, of this here uh, doing a quantum superposition of going from the left to the and the right. Uh, so maybe quantumness allows you to do things that you cannot do classically, and maybe you can do solve optimization problems faster. No? And on top of that, there are other classical approaches, for example, SDP relaxations. Okay, there is other approaches you can find, and indeed SDP relaxation are rather efficient for some of these uh, problems too. So um, as as I anticipated before, I one approach of solving this with a quantum algorithm was this variational quantum algorithm. As I guess many of you know what is a variational quantum algorithm, but maybe some of you don't, so I'm gonna explain this. So the idea is very similar to, to the how you approach this numerically with in, like people in many body physics. I mean, people in many body physics will have some intuition about the problem. You decide you have a family of quantum states you can represent with your classical algorithm. And then you are going to have a lot of free parameters and you are going to try to optimize among these free parameters in order to find the ground state of your Hamiltonian, for example. And you all the cleverness of the algorithm will be on how to do this more efficiently. No? So here, the difference is that instead of having uh, your wave function encoded in a, a hard drive, you have your wave function encoded in a quantum circuit. And the parameters are parameters of the gates, quantum gates of this quantum circuit. So this is why I represent this here by this blue box. This is a quantum circuit uh, with quantum gates. Each gate has some free parameters, and this defines your ansatz family. So you need to have uh, this ansatz family. Uh, you will build it with some intuition about the problem, uh, and then uh, you need to find a way of of uh, computing this uh, cost function for that state. No? You, you, you create a circuit with a given set of parameters, and then you want to uh, compute this cost function for that quantum state. So that means you need to have a set of measurements, a clever technique. This is sometimes not obvious uh, to how to do this the best way, but you will have a technique of doing many measurements on the same copy, uh, many copies of the same state. You do many measurements, and from that, you estimate the cost function, the construction value for that quantum state. And you, and then, uh, you will build a strategy similar to this gradient descent we saw before and things like that, where basically what you want to do is to how to navigate this set of free parameters of your quantum circuit in order to reach the optimal solution, okay? Somehow here, the intuition is that instead of encoding your quantum state in a classical computer, you are just encoding it in a quantum computer and, and you are trying to uh, extract the cost function of that uh, quantum state and then you just do a minimization uh, descent, uh, uh, whatever technique you, you can invent, okay? I'm not gonna go into details of that. Uh, we don't need it here. And of course, as I mentioned, what, what this work was about is to explore what is the effect of the noise in the quantum computation. And the model we, we consider in this, in this work was a model of depolarizing noise, so local depolarizing noise. So every time there's a layer of gates, every qubit may suffer a local depolarizing noise. Um, so basically what happens, a depolarizing noise, a way of seeing that is with you have your density matrix grow and with some priority, you just get the same row, and with some one minus p, you get the uh, maximal unique state. Okay. And uh, another way of seeing that is if you see your quantum, if you think about the uh, hyper block sphere no, of, of n qubits, basically your state when it's pure is in the surface, and then it's going to be sinking uh, further and further down to the center of your sphere. Okay. The more the more noise, the polarizing noise uh, you have. Okay, um, so um, sorry, I will just uh, maybe I missed this part. So, do you have global depolarizing noise or local? Like we we, every we did we did local depolarizing noise. Okay. Mm -hmm. But okay, but corresponding to every gate or sort of uh, acting just at the end of the uh, of the circuit. Yeah. No, we every layer. After so every layer of gates is followed by a layer of depolarizing. 
Okay. Thanks. And that's okay. So this is the idea of the sketch of the concept of the proof. Okay. Uh, the proof is high, of course more technical, but at the end, if you look at the proofs, uh, it's not that difficult. Okay. It's just here is the intuition. Okay. So the intuition of is the following you are doing a quantum ideally you are supposed to do a quantum computation i was showing you before this variational quantum algorithm that is supposed to be ideal only pure state reality is not that you have uh noise okay so in in the ideal world an ideal circuit is this orange uh trajectory here is some trajectory on the surface of your hyper block sphere from your input state to some ideally you will write you would like to reach the solution exact solution, but maybe you don't, but somehow that's not so important. Uh, you are just walking the hypersurface, navigating it in a clever way. Uh, what really happened is that your quantum state uh, is not following that trajectory, but something that is more like you see here in black, okay? Uh, a noisy circuit is gonna be sinking, and indeed it's sinking exponentially fast to the center of the block sphere, okay? So that's, that's and this can be, and what is nice is you can formalize what this happens using techniques like hyperconductivity. Uh, so this is what we were using basically to bound how it allows you to to bound how close you are getting to the to the to the center of this of the block sphere. Good, but that that's uh, not enough. Uh, so what we do is then use another thing, another trick that basically says because even if it's noisy. It could be a very weird state, okay? It could be somewhere in the inside the sphere, which is very complex to represent. So what you can do is basically what was very key and nice is that for every point you are like here in this uh, blue ellipses you have, we have a quantum state at a given stage. We don't know what the state is, but we can give another um, another state that is a Gibbs state, and we can guarantee that. Um, that is always a better solution, okay, than the other one, okay. So somehow you you can always show that uh, for a given quantum state, you can always give another Gibbs state that uh, that uh, has a better solution, okay. Uh, and this is using this concept of mirror descent, okay. I will make give a bit more detail uh, in the next slide. So basically, then what becomes basically okay with the noisy trajectory may be very complicated, but now this can be mapped into a trajectory that is very well defined. Uh, and we can just bound in which point you are as, as the circuit is growing. Uh, and then the last element we need for the proof is this blue circle, uh, sorry, <laughs> this red uh, circle here, that is uh, basically an area where we know that you have a classical algorithm that can do deep sampling at high temperature, okay? so. Computer scientists and some uh, physicists working in many OED physics has been working uh, for a long time in finding classical algorithms that do sampling uh, or, of, uh, or compute uh, properties of high temperature gift states, for example. So here, here what we need is just to show that uh, for a given Hamiltonian beyond a given temperature or below a given beta, uh, that Hamiltonian can be sampled efficiently classically. Okay, when you have this result, in the, in our cases, we were exploiting well-known results uh, about icing spin uh, models. Then uh, this defines uh, this red area here. That is an area of classical simulability, a polynomial time classical algorithm. Okay, so when you have that, somehow you can just basically with this tool what we can say is we can tell you how many layers of quantum computation you need to hit the enter the area that is red that is classically simulable okay and when you are there you you are classically simulable so you don't expect any uh, quantum advantage you could still claim that quantum you get a polynomial advantage but we can discuss that uh, later okay uh, somehow the kind of bound we get with this technique uh, I show you here basically is somehow the depth of the circuit is bounded uh, by something that is very similar to the bound I was anticipating in this back of the, of the envelope calculation. So it's something that scales like one divided by the priority of error of the gate. Uh, 
and then there is some terms. Uh, this um, this epsilon is kind of your precision uh, of the of the solution you want. Okay. But what is nice is that it's just all algorithmic dependence. Okay. So this, even if you change the order of magnitude of your precision, it will only be affecting by a small number your constant. Okay. So. So, so te more technically, uh, like this noisy circuit, uh, how we do this is basically, as I mentioned, this hypercontractivity. No? So basically what we do is to use hypercontractivity just to tell you how close you are getting to the center, okay? Uh, how much the relative entropy uh, uh, is, makes you show how close you are getting to the maximally mixed state. And uh, this uh, mirror descent, basically what it says is that the trace of my noisy version of, of the quantum state after a given set of computations, basically is lower bounded by a Gibbs state minus some, uh, this epsilon is a relative error I was mentioning. But, and this Gibbs state has a parameter lambda and this lambda is kind of bounded with the relative entropy. No? So, so somehow, by combining these things, okay, uh, we can bound the relative entropy thanks to hypercontractivity plus this mirror descent result allows you to tell you to exactly know when you are entering this uh, red area of classical simulation. And this area is usually given by results of this kind. No? So beta is the temperature of the Gibbs state you can uh, simulate. So if beta is smaller than one half divided by some norm of the graph you want to solve, uh, uh, then by then you have a classical algorithm. No? So combining these tools, um, you 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 can uh, you can uh, do what what get the result we obtain and do the analysis of the form I'm going to show you now. Okay, so in the paper we did uh, a very so yeah, well, just. One quick question. So this A is a, is it a local term in the Hamiltonian or no? Here I think this A. Sorry, here I, I think in this A is probably a, a something related to the graph, the 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 matrix, the agency matrix, matrix of the graph. Or, matrix. I, I don't remember now, but I, this and it's probably related to the Hamiltonian in some way. But but this is some condition on the classical simulation. So this this kind of um, results usually tell you, oh, uh, if beta is smaller than something that will depend in the norm of the graph or of the Hamiltonian or something like that, then it's classically similar. Okay, so then we did some estimates and we took the, uh, an experiment by Google. Uh, they did a QOA experiment. Uh, again, QOA is not so important. It's basically a, a one of the, you could think of it as a, an example of this variational quantum circuit that I was mentioning before. So you have layers of gates uh, with some parameter, three parameters. Uh, and, and then here, what, uh, what is important is usually you define this in terms of layers, but every layer has a, needs an amount of gates, okay? So when you do take all this into account, um, and then you can think about different graphs you want to solve, okay? We want to solve mass cut, okay? Remember, we want to solve mass cut. You can have graphs that are all-to-all um, -all connected, like SK, SK model, or you may have graphs that are more of this form that computer scientists like to study, where you have a three regular graph because every vertex has at most three connections, for example, okay? Uh, and then you can do a bit of counting on saying, oh, what will be uh, the number of gates you need per layer of QOA, okay? So here, for example, we were, we were estimating that for SK model, Basically, the number of gates, uh, in general, the number of gates you need per layer of QOA will grow proportionally to this, the size of the graph you want to solve. That's, and the reason for that is because these architectures, the, the, Google, the superconducting circuit architecture, they only have nearest neighbor interaction. So if you want to do some kind of strong connection between two very far away qubits, the only way is to do it by little step that bring one to the other next one next to the other okay some hot as intuition so so if you want to do a very general op operation uh we're all told to each other you need a depth of of layers of gates that is kind of proportional to the number of qubits 
Okay, so 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 somehow every layer of QA uh, is proportional to the number of qubits that is kind of related to the size of your graph, because every qubit, uh, every vertex of the graph is encoded in a qubit. Uh, and therefore, even if the the bound I showed you before is just a bound on the depth of the circuit, uh, we were not able to include the size of the number of qubits in the bound, for example. Uh, even that, because now the depth of the circuit is connected to the size of the instance of the problem you want to solve, as I mentioned before, you can kind of have a bound on the size of a reasonable problem you can expect to solve, okay? And this is a bit what we were doing here, okay? We were showing what is the gate noise in logarithmic scale, okay? So this is a priority of error of a gate. Uh, so the farther away, the farther you are on the left, the better your gate is, okay? And the two red dots are basically the current, st the status at that time of the priority of error. And here uh, on the y-axis, I have the system size you can hope to solve uh, with as, as, you are, you, as you improve your gate of uh, priority. And you can see that even a change of two orders of magnitude, so now we are around 10 to the minus two in, in two qubit gate probabilities, okay? Even if you scale down by two orders of magnitude, you are still at sizes of graphs of thousand. Uh, and this thousand is something that uh, can be done classically. I mean, it's not trivial, but uh, can be done, okay? So, but, but there are some caveats on the previous approach. Uh, for example, one of them could be, yeah, but saying that it's classically simulable, it could be a polynomial that is horrible, no? So can we do something more specific or even more interesting if, and also the previous technique was comparing um, kind of the quantum algorithms to something that is basically simulated annealing. But simulated annealing doesn't need to be the best classical algorithm. It could even do better. So make it more difficult for the quantum computer. So then what we did is to, that was a nice <clears throat> uh, derivation was to, to give you a, basically what we do with, this is kind of a second technique in the paper. So you could think this about two different things, okay? And this is a recipe to kind of certify classically superiority in some sense. So, so basically we, we, what we, the way it works is we give a lower bound to the, op, the, the best solution a quantum computer could give, okay? Uh, of course, if the lower bound is too low, <laughs> it, it, it will be useless. But what is interesting is, so basically here you have on the left, the, what will be the expectation that the quantum circuit will give you a solution. And then you can lower bound this by some quantity that is not thin else more than a partition function of, the, of your Hamiltonian. And then there, somehow a relative entropy that is kind of connected to the entropy you accumulate as noise is accumulating in the system, okay? So here, basically this lower bound is what is plotted in this figure, okay? This red line is this bound, okay? So here I'm giving you the energy, uh, the energy per qubit, somehow it's an energy density uh, as a function of the relative entropy density too. So somehow if you are in the, if you are in the left side, at zero, you are a uh, maximally mixed state and your bound is, is, is not very useful, okay? Uh, you get a very bad solution. Uh, and then at the very right side, you are supposed to be a pure state, okay? So this bound is very a very bad bound of the solution. You should never use this to estimate what the quantum computer will give, but it's a decent bound. So what you can use this for is that it is tell you how, um, it's a lower bound to the optimal solution of the quantum computer, right? So, so basically, if you have, if someone comes to you and say, oh, for this specific problem, I have this classical algorithm and it reaches this value, okay? And we did that for three types of, 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 of approaches. Like in, in green, you can see annealing, simulated annealing. In yellow is SDPs, for example, or uh, blue was an heuristic technique. So these numbers, are, were taken from the literature. We were not doing the simulation ourselves, except for an annealing that Daniel was doing it uh, himself. 
So we were taking some very large graph uh, that for some family of graph that people study, okay, this, we took this instance J12 and, and, and then you can check the literature and what is the value they were expecting. Uh, and once you have these values, then you go to all over bound and this tells you what is a relative entropy that if you go beyond that boundary, uh, if the noise makes you cross that boundary, so remember your system starts at one, okay, when there is no entropy, when the system is pure, the more entropy enters the system, the more you move to the left. So at some point when you cross the boundary, it means that that classical technique is doing better than your, certainly does better than your quantum circuit. Okay, so it's a way of, if you, if you are on a team that is fighting, <laughs> well, fight, competing, so if you are in a team that is competing against quantum computer, let's say, uh, you are a company that is developing class clever classical algorithms, and you want to prove that your classical algorithm is better than the quantum device, basically, our technique will allow you to, to do this comparison and say, oh, I have this classical algorithm, it reaches this value, and now for a given, uh, and then I can tell you uh, what is the relative entropy density beyond which a quantum computer will give a worse solution than our classical algorithm. And then this, if you know what is the noise of the system, um, you can estimate how much, which is the size of the circuit that you need to reach that uh, accumulation of entropy somehow. And, and, and this is somehow what we did, no? and this allows you to, to uh, for example, give bound on the depth of the circuit, and then uh, that are more tight than the bounds I give you before. And if you have a bound on the depth of the circuit, because there's a connection between depth of the circuit and size of the instance, you can also bound the size of the instances you can solve, okay? Um, okay, so, so I'm done with the technical part. Maybe I, I, and we are reach, reaching the end, so I also have time. I wanted just to give a, a bit of discussion, some open questions and things like that. So. So of course, our work is just a starting point. Okay, so so one of the things you one could uh, point about our work is that we consider a very specific model of noise. No? So uh, it's true that it's considered a very it's established model of noise. Uh, first starting point uh, is a decent approximation of what is happening, but it's not everything what is happening in terms of noise. So can we generalize this work to more general models of noise or more accurate? models of noise. Um, then uh, in the work we, and in the, in the work we did a bit of that, okay, but also for local noises. So we consider other models of noise that are local, uh, again, so qubit by qubit, the same in every qubit, but they are not necessarily the polarizing noise. We, we give that, but it's fair to say that the result is get worse and worse as you are farther away from the, the polarizing noise, okay. Uh, Another thing we did is to, we did a continuous time version of this, okay? So this will work for D-Wave, for example. Indeed in the paper, I don't know if it's at the end in the final version of the paper, but at least in the archive version, we, we did an analysis of a continuous time uh, system. Um, and you can, this technique I just explained can be used, using this continuous time can be used to, to machines like D-Wave, for example, okay? Uh, but also more, in, maybe also interestingly, will be to, to apply this to many body physics systems. No? Say, uh, for example, when you have continuous time, no, you have a continuous uh, evolution of a, of a quantum simulator, but the quantum simulator has noise. So at which point my quantum simulator is classically simulable in some way. No? Uh, so of course, um, or work impose strong constraints and conclusions about using optimization problems in current devices. But it's also fair to say that current devices are progressing, not only in the priority of the gates, but also adding new features that are not uh, addressed by our proof, okay? For example, our proof doesn't allow for refreshing of qubits, okay? So if you start including, adding fresh qubits into the system, we will need to rethink about our proof, okay? Uh, I'm not saying that it's not possible. Uh, probably a similar result is possible, but it will be a bit more uh, com um, <laughs> needs, it's open there, okay? It needs to be proven. Uh, so our new direction of research will be that to see, oh, uh, what if we have more uh, 
clever ways of, because basically what is going to happen is we are hoping to reach full tolerance at some point in the future. Now we are in this situation where we just run a circuit up to the end and we measure, but in between, it's like we are in discussing two extremes, no? And most probably we are gonna walk a path toward full tolerance and it will be adding gadgets and adding new features uh, that are kind of a preliminary concept of quantum error correction, maybe quantum error correction that is targeting a specific problem, uh, things like that that are not universal fault tolerance, but still brings you some uh, time or depth of, of quantum computation. Uh, okay, so all these new techniques that are going to be added in the future uh, will need to be. Uh, We'll need to do new proof for these new features. Okay, so so or 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 work as it is now. Only address current circuit where you have a circuit run until the end, and then you measure. Okay, uh, and uh, also there is interesting work. This is done at the moment also on on finding fundamental limitations to fault tolerance. No? There was a paper very recently. Um, on, for example, bounding the size of a system uh, of a quantum computer, uh, a fault tolerant quantum computer, and using also techniques of quantum Shannon entropy, uh, quantum information. Okay, so um, also our work, we we were taking examples of of optimization problems that are classical icing models, but all these recipes uh, apply for fermionic and bosonic problems. Okay. So of course, it, this need adaptation. So it's not that it's just not taking our paper and then just giving it to a to a maybe undergrad student, <laughs> and then you get a paper. But it will probably need a bit of thinking beyond that. Uh, most probably because these algorithms are using some kind of encoding from qubit to fermions, and therefore what happened is that what will be a noise that is local, maybe in the qubit system, is something very crazy in the fermionic system. So, so it doesn't mean that the noise you see on your quantum device is gonna have this nice walk on Gibbs state that we were having in our result. Okay, it may not translate to a very nice Gibbs state of fermions, for example. So it's not obvious to do that. Uh, well, I mean, maybe simple. I just haven't tried, but but uh, it's also not. I don't think it's obvious immediately, no? Like he, he, he needs a bit of thinking. Uh, I don't know how hard it is, uh, but uh, another direction of uh, this can be investigated further. And finally, another one is finding a bound where you really can include the number of qubits because up to now I was giving you a bound on, on the depth, no? And the reason why your bound is only including the depth is because we use impaired contractivity. But returning to a back of the, let's finish the, the talk with a back of the block again. So if you do this assumption that you, you can think the quantum computation as a volume, no? you have, especially for this superconducting circuit, you have a 2D lattice, uh, and then you have the third dimension will be time, no? that you have layers of gates. Let's assume that if one gate fails, everything goes wrong. Then you can also do the same estimation, and then you will say, oh, the number of qubits time the death is lower is upper bounded by one divided the priority of error. Okay, and this also a very reasonable estimation. Uh, instead of having a bound on the depth, it's really a bound on the volume that you get. If you are not doing any error correction, somehow the intuition is the volume of quantum computation you can do is something of the order of one divided by uh, one di uh, divided by p. And indeed, if you take the numbers of the quantum circuit by Google, I mean they have. I give you the numbers here. You have fifty qubits a depth of around 20, for example, and a priority of failure of 10 to the minus three, all these numbers match very well with my, with this back of the envelope bound. No? So it's reasonable to assume that something like this could be proven. Uh, and it's, it's even worse than my previous result. Okay, I have explained it to you. It will be even more stringent to quantum computers. Good, so I'm, I'm, done, I'm finished with the talk. I leave you with the very first slide uh, where I was just saying that this is not just about fighting the hype, but also I hope that is by investigating how quantum computers uh, doesn't work or work or for which problems they work better or not, we can maybe build better quantum computers or and also maybe see which problems are um, better suited for quantum computers, okay? 
So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thanks all for the great and inspiring talk. Uh, yes, you you made it on time perfectly because I was <laughs> uh, talking for too long initially. Um, we have uh, time for questions or comments discussion now. So if you, maybe to maybe to make it organized, maybe you can raise your hand and then. Uh, you know, we pick you and you will be asking questions. Please, uh, Fab. So, hi, uh, Raul. So, could you maybe briefly mention what is the essence of this indicating this thermal state that is better? Because, because this is, I, I guess, the key in your proof, yes? That you, you indicate this thermal state which performs better so, so can you mention this construction? How it's, uh, what do you use there? So, um, so this is this. Well, indeed. Um, so initially we were using this mirror descent uh, that is basically connecting, giving this lower bound to the expectation value with another Gibbs state. Uh, the only thing is. The Gibbs state parameter is 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 it's you can you bound this parameter between zero and a uh, quantity that is basically the relative entropy of your state. Uh, and personally, the, I I mean the, I don't have a clear intuition on on, on this. Uh, the, the, uh, it's a technique that Daniel knew, uh, and it it's something that is. Uh, that is, but it's crucial. But it's crucial that it's depolarizing noise. Yes, I guess. Well, it's or not. no, 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 no. So, so, so it's 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 crucial to be very effective result. Let's say so. So the our result works for other no, model of noise. Mm -hmm. uh, we needed to to do we have if you look at the paper in the supplement in the well not the supplementary material but in the like the paper at the end has an additional. Uh, content. Um, uh, in, in there, we explain a bit. Um, this can be extended non-trivially uh, uh, to, uh, to noises that are not, not uh, depolarizing noise. But it's true that it gets worse, OK? If, okay, you have, okay. if, you have, if you have amplitude damping, perfect amplitude damping is useless or proof, OK? Okay, okay. I just thought that maybe so somehow some it's an interpolation. So if you have an uh, amplitude damping, uh, nothing works. Uh, and anything that is in between the two is kind of an interpolation. No? Okay, so so of course the polarizing noise is the one that is will be most damaging to um, uh, to this. Well, okay. not to the system because that's a too, too strong a statement. So is is the one for which or proof works best? <laughs> it doesn't mean that is the noise that is most damaging to the quantum system, to the quantum computation itself. Okay. 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 Thanks. Uh, but later on, we found an, a, another bound that doesn't use this mirror descent, and it, it can it, it uses uh, some uh, simple. Uh, relative entropy properties and things like that. So if you go to the supplementary material, indeed we have even a, a, a shorter proof of that. I don't remember now, but if you send me an email, I can just comment a bit more on the on which part you need to go and 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 and, and give you some intuition about it. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, more questions or comments? Uh, please, uh, Krzysztof, Chris. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you, Raúl, for a very interesting and inspiring talk. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you've done some experiments with with D-wave uh, systems. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit uh, about the, those experiments? Have you performed those experiments on the previous generation 2000 mm -hmm. D-wave machine and the one uh, D? Uh, I think it's called. We, it's we didn't do any experiment, so so maybe I was not clear. Uh, so what we did is uh, an analysis of what will happen. Like we apply our technique to a D wave machine. Uh, it was a very, it was a bit. So I have two things to say. It, it, it's a difficult analysis, uh, more than for qubit because you have it's more physicist like uh, device. Okay, it's continuous time, and so it was on one hand it was easier to find 
uh, the characteristic of the system on the D-Wave. So we went to the D-Wave website and we they have some information on their system. And from there, took it took me a bit of time to kind of understand how it works and the parameters. And, and from that, we got some kind of intuition of what will be the errors. And and we we, we had some models of noise, okay, that they, they also discuss in their, in their website, which by the way, the way has received a lot of criticism in the past, but they are probably now the more transparent in terms of what is going on in their device, uh, in terms of noise uh, and imperfection. Um, and this is what we did. Okay, we took their numbers, tried to understand. It, it was not perfect. I mean, it's not obvious to do that. Um, so it was a bit of reverse engineering in some sense. Okay, and then from that we plug that into our model and do some estimate on when. Uh, deep wave solving mass cut will be uh, overcome by a classical computer. Okay, but I, I, I personally, I, uh, I think our result on the wave will need a bit of kind of more detailed study in the sense that it's not obvious uh, to make strong claims about that in the sense that the outcomes we get is like instead of depth of circuit, it will be time of evolution of the Hamiltonian or things like that. But I don't feel that we understand that well the device itself, myself, I mean, in order to be as clear as we were on our claims about, for example, QOA and Google device. Okay. Uh, I think it needs more, a bit more deeper analysis. But the same things I have said. Uh, for the Google device can be reproduced for the wave with our techniques on how, I mean, with extensions techniques uh, that we provide in the paper, that is discontinuous time, uh, for example, and also noise that is non-depolarizing because the wave has some noise that is not depolarizing. Okay. And this we take into account. So, so basically all the techniques we develop that is for non-depolarizing beyond depolar depolarizing noise are put into practice in the D wave analysis. Okay. So the DWA analysis is much more um, uh, non-trivial uh, analytically, and, and, and yeah, but I cannot say the thing. Okay, you can read, you can see the numbers, but it doesn't talk to me as much as as, as the result of a qubit system, let's say with with discrete gates. Okay, if if it makes sense. Okay, thanks. So, so if someone <laughs> in the audience is an expert on D-Wave machines and wants to, to, to do the analysis, is, is, I think it's, it will be interesting. The thing is, D-Wave needs some kind of understanding of, of these um, quantum annealing devices and problems that maybe we are not experts as experts as needed to do a more stronger statement on, on, on those devices. Yeah, at least it would be good, you know, to do to run some experiments and, uh, you know, uh, based on your model, uh, try, you know, to see uh, and compare, you know, what's uh, the, the theory versus, you know, practical uh, experiments uh, can, you know. So, I mean, deliver. you have to see what an experiment brings to our analysis. So, because I mean, you by experiment, you mean an experiment on the actual quantum device. Yes. So, so that also interesting will be kind of a, comp but um, so our, our tools will allow you maybe to, I mean, it's not something you can probably observe experimentally directly, uh, unless you have a, what you can do is maybe to do, have a classical computer, uh, a classical algorithm, and then you can use similar tools to say, oh, uh, Beyond this level of noise, this classical devoid machine is not providing any solution uh, better than this classical one, for example. Uh, I, I'm not sure how much or techniques tell you about the actual physical device. I mean, it, it tells you about its limitations, no? but uh, I don't know if you, you can learn something about doing the Classical, the quantum, uh, running the quantum experiment itself at the same time. Um, because, for example, we have two kinds of results. Okay, the very first one I mentioned 
is more like an asymptotic statement. Is is when to, it becomes classically similar, and and uh, and then you have uh, it's more an argument about uh, what is the maximum depth, uh, and so it's more asymptotic. It's more a theoretical analysis. The second result that was this blobber bound I was mentioning. This can be put into a, a, a an experiment, let's say, but the experiment will be having both maybe classical algorithms versus quantum maybe. Um, Yeah, you, um, you're, yeah, you're right. So, can I jump jump in with quick questions about numbers? Because maybe you, I mean you, uh, uh, like uh, for superconducting qubits, like when you assume that, that let's say reasonable uh, level of error, what are the QA away instances that uh, your analysis, let's say, allow, that uh, like. Hmm. Yeah, basically, uh, yeah, is yeah, it yeah. at all useful in the light of your results? Like, if you have one percent of error, or like, uh, well, well, what? For example, or technique, I mean, or uh, or the technique we use, like the the plot I was showing you. If you do the analysis for, for example, for the kind of gates errors that they were done in that experiment, we are kind of very close to the numbers of the graphs they were really solving. <laughs> So I think Google was doing uh, maybe like doing better than just random guessing. Okay, when Google was doing better than random guessing, was maybe a size of a seventeen, a graph of seventeen for an SK model or something like that. And or bound, I mean, if or bound is saying classical do better than quantum, uh, which is even. Uh, before that, okay, before you become classical better than quantum, and then quantum becomes equivalent to random guessing, which is the worst classical algorithm you can imagine, okay? So before that, there's other classical algorithms that can do better, no? But, or, or bound is somehow telling you pass the boundary to classical simulability, and the orders of magnitude were the kind of, I mean, it was not 17, but maybe it was 20 something. Or, so mm -hmm. it was kind of a very similar number. And this is what made us very excited. And this is probably the reason why we submitted to, to nature physics, because it was a bound that was kind of getting it uh, reasonably really well. No? Um, yeah. Sure. Just for, OK, we have, please, Suchanta, another uh, question, I guess. Suchanta, I'm not sure if I pronounced your name right. Or it's a... Suchetana? Oh. Uh, maybe okay. just the hand uh, is raised since the beginning. We are like happy to, to take your question. Just okay, in case you're not saying anything, I, I have some follow up question to that also. Okay. Uh, wait, what was. Uh, yeah, so um, how your results and say stand in, like, you know, uh, when you start to use error mitigation, because I, I, I wasn't really. Uh, I see. Uh, so, right. So, uh, can I just finish? The, okay. My question mm -hmm. is like: so, can error mitigation circumvent somehow your uh, the uh, your results, or they are doomed to fail uh, anyway? Like, um, that's a good question. So, uh, initially, I I thought that they will not. Uh, but it's true that it's, uh, it's certainly if you have a classical algorithm that simulates the quantum device, if you do any post-processing, it will just do the same. No? But it's true that our, our result is not about a classical simulation of the quantum device. No? Uh, it's a prediction of the expectation value. Uh, so, you, it's a good question. Uh, I think we should uh, look at how, how mitigation ent combines with our proof. I think it should be possible to include it and address it. But it's true that initially I thought that it was, oh, it will not do anything. Um, but I don't think I have a proof of that rigorous. Um, what? Uh, I mean, 
I can't my I can also give you my my intuition from uh, error mitigation is that it's a nice tool, but it's kind of a short term solution in some sense. Uh, it's something the way I see it is signal post processing. Look, look, so it's something that is very nice for experimentalists because they they have a lot of data that are very uh, like very bad and and they can kind of filter them or process them to get the best you can from your data uh, but uh, if something is not providing the quantum advantage by doing error mitigation is not gonna bring you back the quantum advantage in some sense that's my, my intuition and most of these techniques are in general doesn't scale well in with the size no so uh, but it's true that uh, it will be good to to do a more rigorous analysis combining the post processing uh, into our framework. Uh, I definitely think it's a, it's a good uh, a good topic. <laughs> uh, I see that uh, Sushitana was writing the question, so maybe I can give it a try. Sure. Yeah. Uh, she was asking. Uh, could you elaborate a little more when you have amplitude damping channel? Uh, also, is it in the ideal ADC or the more general one when the environment is not in absolute zero? The second part I don't understand, but so th what I can say about amplitude damping channel is that uh, we were our result doesn't work basically when you are in ideal amplitude damping channel. If your amplitude damping is in the way that it, it's um, also having a bit of thermal noise, then of course you can give, uh, you can, uh, or result will give you something, but it's a very little something, okay? <laughs> the closer you are to the depolarizing noise, the, the best in some sense. Um, Uh, so, uh, just a general question: Is it is your result similar in that respect to to some earlier res results of Rafael? That you know, if your channel is ex local and like extremal, you can you know you uh, you know what I'm talking about this uh, no. loss of uh, Heisenberg scaling. So, is it kind no, of no, no, is it the no, sir. What? I don't know which which result. Well, like, uh, okay, like, the, like, okay, I found out small. Hey, maybe like, uh, since, Michal is, <laughs> yeah. since Michal is trying to, to say something. <laughs> okay, so I think Michal is referring to this fact that we had a, one, one of our proofs that in quantum metrology, when you have noise, you lose Heisenberg scaling. Had ah. also this, this geometric uh, picture in it. Where, where you were using some kind of, we call it classical simulation, in which channels, which were more, more inside the set of channels, it was easy to prove that the Heisenberg scaling is lost, while the extremal channels were a bit more tricky. Yes, this is, I think, Miha, what you wanted to ah. say. But, but I'm not sure if it's, if it's really, I mean, I, I, I'm still thinking in my mind if there is some deeper connection here, but, but in the end, we have other ways to show that in our case, amplitude damping is also bad. <laughs> so That's we can also prove it in, in using different means. Uh -huh. In our case, that it's more subtle because in our case, it's the interplay between the signal, which is the this, this signal you get from some uh, process you want to sense and the noise that you don't want. While, while in your case, there is, I would say no particular fixed signal you want to protect, I guess. Yes. I mean, yeah, no. You, you have the set of gates which is which are arbitrary, yeah. basically. So uh, my my intuition about these two noises is the following, but uh, so somehow or proof works well when to say something about accumulating entropy in the system. So as basically this is what I was discussing this curve. Basically, if you look, if, if your channel is the polarizing noise, this relative entropy. Uh, maybe I can go to this graph. Uh, uh, let me. So this, you see now the the figure again. Okay. So this red figure here, this relative entropy density. If you do, I mean, is the equation here on the top? Okay. Is this relative entropy here? Uh, sigma rho is the maximally mixed state. Uh, so somehow, if you 
do the calculation, this is n minus the entropy of your quantum system. So in some sense, this quantity, this in some ways, nothing else than a, how the accumulation of entropy in your system uh, affects your quantum computation. And, but this is what this bound is somehow is about, no? but uh, in some way. But, but if you look at the amplitude damping channel, it's a channel that is some sense is removing entropy, but it's also damaging. So, so it's kind of a very different kind of noise in some sense is you have, so some, you have noises that damage you because they provide, bring entropy and you need to pump out the entropy. Then you have other channels that are maybe doing more like an erasure, uh, an erasure that is maybe sending you to a pure state. It's not increasing the entropy, even decreasing the entropy, but it's kind of doing a damage that is maybe, and the question is how we are, in order how to, of, in order to analyze the amplitude damping channel maybe more efficiently, you will have to find ways of quantifying how you damage your quantum computation when you erase or something like that. I, yeah, I think I think you would need to specify more your circuit. Yes, I mean in some way what your circuit is yeah. supposed to be doing, no? or maybe having an intuition on where the solution is, uh -huh. in the sense that because if the fixed point is your I don't know. Let's assume that the fixed point is the all zero no, of the amplitude, amplitude damping channel. If you kind of kind of have a bound on how far the ideal solution is from this point, maybe by knowing how you are getting close to that point, you know how far you are getting from the ideal solution or something like that. No? Uh, yeah, that makes sense. I mean. Uh, right. I mean, also, like, there are, I guess, no uh, results on the classical smallability in the vicinity of this all zero state, for example, because it's not for. Uh, ah. Uh, well, I guess in that case. I mean, you can, of course. Uh, in that case, you, because you are doing the expectation value, in that case, it's going to, well, in that case, it's a separable state. So, sure, so sure. you can compute it. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So, so in that case, The question is, it's not even obvious to me that if you have layers of amplitude damping channel, but then you are doing other things in between, whether you converge or not to zero, no. No? like that's another, <laughs> uh, certainly if I apply the damp amplitude damping on a row, I will reach zero. But if I start doing uh, things in the middle, uh, what is going on, what is gonna happen there? Uh, that's also an interesting question. Right. I don't know if you have anyone in the room has a, a clear a vision of what, but I, I think it's an interesting question and maybe not obvious to, to show, uh, but you need to understand that to do kind of the analysis we are trying to, to do, no? So, yeah. so there is a lot of work to do in this area of uh, <laughs> studying the, the effects of imperfections. Uh, and it brings together tools that are, well, tools as you were mentioning, I have a past in quantum communication and things like that. So all these tools of Shannon theory, uh, people that work on resource theories that, uh, <laughs> as you mentioned resource theories, so I guess there are people on resource theories are probably tools that are familiar to these uh, people. Um, or, people working in quantum thermodynamics, things like that are kind of somehow connected to these questions I was talking about today. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's all very inspiring. Uh, Thank you. Okay, so last chance, uh, you know, uh, to, to ask something to Raul before we conclude. Uh, uh, yes, Rafael has left already. Uh, okay, if there are no further questions, uh, let's thank the speaker again for a great talk and uh, yeah, interesting discussion. Uh, and thank you for uh, you all for showing up. Uh, thank you for yes. yeah, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it was a pleasure, a lot so, of fun. <laughs> uh, 
same here, I guess. And uh, yeah, next colloquium will take place in roughly, yeah, I guess, at the beginning of April. Uh, right. And uh, yeah, what can I say? Okay. Uh, stay, <laughs> stay self, uh, safe, and maybe in uh, good mental health in those like a bit uncertain times. <laughs> All mm -hmm. of you. Thanks again, Raul, for joining us today. <laughs>